to the extent of independent assortment and understanding um, uh, uh, understanding um, like uh, uh, just just the two the two gene kind squares um, and then uh, the, the cell cycle regulation I mean, it's a of cancer being the main theme chapter 14 is, is pretty heavily discussed in so chapter 12 and chapter 14 um, and then there's stuff about the, the, the last lecture from Friday, there's sort of information from that scattered through chapter 6, 7, 16, and 17. But you, again, you only need to know stuff I actually talked about from that, and not everything that's in those chapters. Uh, and then anything that was on exam one might come up either independently or sort of looking for connections between like translation and proteins, and proteins getting processed in the ER or something. Yeah, I um, there's I think you said the the, the definition or like the explanation really concisely once. Um, so like how can be different um, different dominant side organisms like recessive at the, uh, the organisms. Right. So dominant for an organism means one copy and you get a phenotype. Yes. Um, dominant for a cell means one copy and you can do the biochemistry. 
and which okay. equates to being a functional group. Okay. Um, and for everything to cancer, those are the same thing. Um, depending on how much time we end up spending on um, uh, on um, meiosis and um, and also on on sex chromosomes on Friday. I might throw in a second example where that doesn't work out, but for now we'll just say cancer is the only thing. Um, and the reason that cancer is the only place where that doesn't so so the reason why it works the reason why it works in general is if all of my cells plus or minus a couple mutant cells that I don't notice because I'm because I'm big and my cells are small. If all of my cells have a particular protein that they can do a particular bit of biochemistry. In me as an organism, I can do that biochemistry in whatever phenotype that corresponds to, whether it's detecting a taste, detecting a smell, hearing a sound, making pigments, whatever it is. I, as an organism, that they're visible or detectable or whatever traits that I have that, that, that happen because of that biochemistry gets done. And so those functional proteins are what affect my phenotype. If I have no functional proteins for a particular allele, or for a particular gene, no functional alleles for a particular gene, then that biochemistry doesn't get done in any of my cells. And so, so that's kind of why they're the same. Okay. Um, and then in cancer, that breaks down because if you have a tumor suppressor gene that is non-functional, that is, from a cell's perspective, recessive. It's a non-functional protein because cells can check their DNA one working copy of P53 or whatever. Um, but from an organism's perspective, you have uh, one copy gives you a significantly increased risk of cancer. Um, if it's something like BRCA2, it's like a, a very significant risk <coughs> of cancer. Something like retinoblastoma, it's essentially a 100% chance of cancer. It's something like P53, and you've got a 100%, basically 100% chance of cancer before you're born, and so, yeah. So, um, so those are so so that and the reason is because the, the the handful of mutant cells, because they're cancer cells, turn into something that you can detect. Well, actually, so if, if if a sperm and egg get together and one or the other of them has has a non-functional allele P53 in it, then then almost certainly that's not that one one bad copy, because because by the time by the time the um, the, the fetus gets to be uh, a few thousand cells, one of those cells will lost P53. P53 is so critical that that fetus is just going to turn into a little too much longer. So that doesn't happen ever. I mean, there's Probably at some point, somebody, some human being has had has had like a spontaneous abortion because like a sperm or egg had a non-functional human degree. But that that doesn't, yeah. And there's no such, there wouldn't be any such thing as somebody missing copies of that. But that happens with retinal blastoma as well. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah. So so in that case, either the sperm or the egg, the the, or, the, the parent had retinal blastoma. I mean, they had all of their cells. We short one copy, um, and with all of the cells short one copy, that includes their gamete cells, sperm or egg cells, short one copy. So when they have a child with another parent, with a partner who's not short a copy of retinoblastoma, then um, then that fertilized egg, whether it was the egg or the sperm that was missing that copy, um, either way, that fertilized egg now has one working copy and one non-working. Retinoblastoma, the protein, is especially important in regulating the density of cells in the pigmented epithelium of your eyes, those cells that are sort of constantly turning over and also support the bone cells, and so they're dividing somewhat frequently in your eyes. Um, and, um, and so, unlike P53, it's not critical for every cell's division. It's only mainly expressed in the eyes and pretty critical for, for regulation of cell division in the eyes. Um, and so what happens is at some point probability catches up 
with the person, and whether they're 10 years old or 30 years old when it happens, at some point they develop tumors in their eyes. Um, but, uh, but it's, um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's similar, I mean, it's similar to P53, but in a sense it's like less critical and less um, common, uh, less, less expressed in less in fewer cells, and there's also some redundancy for it. Um, so that's why it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't show up, well, well, it doesn't show up like in utero, um, the retinopause. Um, and then BRCA2 is like, has some even more redundancy to it, um, which is why you can have an effective copy and not be guaranteed to get cancer, but um, just have a, a very significant issue. Um, sorry, yeah, you had a question? Um, so for retinoblastoma, why is it that just one copy means to Right, because so this, the retinal cells can regulate themselves with one working copy. But if you're born with every cell in the retina missing one copy, then um, at some point by random chance, some cell is going to lose the other copy. So another way to say that is if you looked at every single cell in my retina, you'd find one or two in my retinas that are missing one copy of RP. But since I was born with two copies, that doesn't that doesn't cause any problems for me. Um, but if I but um, but if I had been born with just one working copy in every cell, mm -hmm. then those one or two that are down a copy now would be problems. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so sure. Is this cellularly dominant and organismally recessive? Other way around. It's organismally dominant. So retinoblastoma one non-functional copy in the organism guarantees a phenotype essentially. So it's dominant for the organism. But at a cellular level, you need two missing copies before the cells get into trouble. Every cell starts out one copy down, but they're all fine until <coughs> one of them loses a second copy. Yeah? Or is that just because, like, since they're cancerous, it's going like, to mutate quicker, so it's more likely? No, that happens. So that's after we've lost our tumor suppressors. This is just, like, ev ev mistakes happen in mitosis. Yeah. We catch the cells catch a lot of them, but every, but um, uh, but you know enough cells, a big enough organism, and and you're going to have some mistakes getting through. And every once in a while, that mistake is going to be in, in the RB gene or in the P53 gene or in the BRCA2 gene or whatever. So I feel like I didn't answer your question. Very well, like, wouldn't you need the like? No, that's the thing about cancer is one once one cell loses both copies, then it starts dividing faster than its neighbors. Yeah. Then, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess, but but it's not even the it's not even really about mutation. I mean, mutations come into play as the cancer develops to become more malignant. Uh -huh. But in the first formation of it, it's just being down two copies of a tumor suppressor gene. That cell's going to be dividing faster. Than and then, and then it can start evolving to become more malignant um, as more mutations build up. Okay. But once we've lost two copies of the same tumor suppressor gene, that's when we're already starting to get into trouble territory. Okay. Well, I was like, 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 what's the eye? The eye use? Retinoblastoma. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, that's a, there's a tumor suppressor gene that keeps that keeps the pigmented epithelial cells in my eyes from getting too crowded. So yeah. they start dividing. They sort of go through periods where they're dividing a little bit, and then they start getting crowded. So they stop dividing. They sort of communicate with each other and stop di and, and send signals to stop dividing. Um, sort of the opposite of ABL1, where ABL1 says it receives signals and says yes, we can divide, but in blastoma it receives signals and says no, stop dividing. Yeah. Um, so, so if if any one cell in my retina lost both copies of retinoblastoma, yeah. then that cell would no longer pay attention to the to the rest of my retinal cells when they say stop dividing. Yeah. So it's going to keep going even when the stop signal shows up. Mm -hmm. And so then I'm going to have now instead of one cell, then I've got two cells, then they keep dividing, then I've got four cells, then they keep dividing, then I've got eight cells, and so all of a sudden I've got this big growth in my retina. Uh, of this, it started from just a single cell that had two that had two missing copies of the retinoblastoma, okay. and that could happen to me if I were pretty darn unlucky. 
Because like I said, I've got a couple cells in my retina that have lost one or the other, and if one of those cells, or its daughter cell, or granddaughter cell, or whatever, lost the second one, then, then, then they would start to grow and keep growing. They, would, they, would never, they wouldn't get the stop signal, so they just keep dividing, and then, and then I get this, this growth in my eye. Yeah. And at some point, some, some of, and then when it gets to be big enough, some of them stop checking their DNA because they picked up extra mutations, and then they start figuring it. Is that kind of? Oh, um, uh, actually, sure, yeah, you. Um, I didn't mention it in lecture in terms of hunting proteins, but can you talk about toxic proteins and how they relate to dominant recessive? And sure. Of cell and so, um, so for them, it's a function, but it's a bad function. It's the function that the func the, the active version of the Huntington's gene um, creates toxic buildup. In so neurons, like dominant at this, like it's like dominant at a cellular system. level, and it's also dominant at an organ. So Huntington's doesn't violate this sort of like the only it's not cancer, and so it doesn't break the rule. It's about dominant being the same thing for organisms. Yeah. So yeah. Oh, sorry. That so only occurs with cancer, like this right? Is where yes. they'll be kind of like yes. inverse. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What do you have to know about cells at the top? Um, the only one you need to know about is right before cells replicate their DNA, they, um, they check for mutations. So BRCA2, XPA, and so on all, um, all look for various types of damage to the DNA. Um, oops. Is that called something? Uh, it's called the, the, uh, the um, PM, uh, let's see, the, I guess, G1S checkpoint, because um, it's at the border between G1 and S phase. Um, so, uh, or the DNA damage checkpoint, um, but, uh, yeah, I guess I didn't even, so, oh yeah, no, that's, so, yeah, um, uh, before entry S phase is DNA damaged, um, uh, and P50, and so, and so bracket two, so these little square things, X, this is Zermodome XPA, this is the book talks about, but I didn't talk about lecture, it looks for, um, uh, ultraviolet light can cause um, two adjacent T's to, to stick together in a funky way, um, where they can get read either as adjacent as two C's or get read as a single C, depending on uh, sort of just random luck, essentially, with DNA polymerase. Um, but, uh, so XPA looks for that type of damage. Bracket 2 looks for uh, double-stranded DNA breaks. Um, there are other things that look for um, uh, um, sometimes C's can get converted to uracil bases, um, which you normally don't find in DNA. Um, and so if there's ever a uracil anywhere, then, then the cell knows that something's gone wrong, and it can go and cut out that uracil and replace it with uh, a C, which is what's supposed to have been there. Um, uh, and, so those, and so when those proteins that are, that are feeling along the DNA to see if there's any mismatched bases or other things get active, then they turn on P53, and then P53 turns on proteins that repair damage, and if it stays on, if P53 stays active for too long, then it turns on proteins that kill itself. stuff. Um, but anyway, that's the only checkpoint you need to know. Yeah? Um, so, going off of that, um, for, to, to develop cancer, is it like directly after, um, P53 is deactivated, or is it when um, when there's a mutation in the gene that causes um, ABL1 to become an oncogene? Um, so, uh, if if you have if you have a single cell that has lost both copies of P53, um, that by itself is not actually a cancer cell yet, um, but it's not checking its DNA, and then it's when the oncogenes get active that it starts to be a cancer cell. Um, as the cancer progresses from a cell biology perspective, the accumulation of more mutations speeds up the progression. Um, and then um, from a clinical perspective, um, uh, sort of how far along it is and how difficult it is to treat and how large the tumor is characterizes what we call stage one, stage two, stage three, or stage four. Um, 
but, um, but that doesn't have a direct one-to-one -one correspondence with the cell biology. Um, so I guess the answer to your question is that it gets complicated. If you just sort of think of um, either loss of both copies of a single tumor suppressor gene or a gain of function in a proteroncogene, either one of those as making a cell cancerous, I'm okay with that for this class. Um, the reality is that you actually need multiple, there, there are multiple semi-redundant systems in there, which is why like BRCA2 mutations don't always lead to cancer, for example. So, but, yeah. um, isn't, doesn't, aren't um, the inactive P53 lead to ABL1? Um, it, it will. If if it if that if those cells keep dividing long enough, then um, they'll keep, they'll pick up more mutations. Most of those mutations will either be not will either be conservative or will kill the cell. Um, but a handful of them might lead to gain of function on proteomic like And so, yes, in a sort of it, from a it, over over weeks and months and months of cell division, so many, many cell generations, then, then one of those great, 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 great granddaughter cells of the cell that lost P53 um, will have a proto-oncogene that becomes, uh, becomes overactive and becomes an oncogene. So it sort of indirectly causes it or sort of eventually causes it, but um, Again, like for this class, if you just sort of think of like once you've lost, once a cell has lost both copies of P53, that cell is trouble. Trouble doesn't exactly mean cancer yet, but that cell is like really at risk of making it turning into cancer. And if you just if you just say it's cancerous, I'm fine with that for this class. S similarly, if you say that once a cell has lost, uh, you've got a gain of function in a proto-oncogene, then that's going to be cancerous. That's a little bit inaccurate, but I'm kind of okay with that too. Um, and certainly, if a cell has lost both copies of the tumor suppressor gene and had uh, gain of function in proto-oncogene, that's a real suit. Like, once it's had both of those things happen, then you're really, really dealing with like a, 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 a cancerous cell. So, I, I guess the sort of, I've sort of been somewhat sloppy in my language because I mostly want to convey the importance of. The, 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 the two working, at least, at least one working copy, but, but really kind of need two in the an organism for the tumor suppressor genes, and then the dominant gain of function problems with proto oncogenes, um, and sort of glossed over some of the details in the stages of tumor evolution in an effort to just sort of convey the, the sort of comparison between tumor suppressor and proto oncogenes. Um, yeah, sure. Um, can you just elaborate on cell junctions and like the relationship to cancer? Uh, yes, in the room. Uh, so um, when when uh, when cells, let's see. So uh, I think that this one has something actually related to, to um, the other question as well. Um, so when a, when a cell loses both copies of a tumor suppressor gene, um, it it's sort of starts to transition into growing a little faster, becoming a benign tumor. As an oncogene, if, an, if the proto-oncogene gets a gain of function and becomes an oncogene, then you're maybe dealing with a malignant tumor. And then um, as you lose more tumor suppressor genes or more oncogenes start to become uh, overactive, this will grow even faster. So like, you know, if, if this one cell that is descended from that moves it, um, has a gain of function in the oncogene, then you come back two weeks later and all of the other cells have been competed out by this one cell. You've sort of got a growth of a malignant tumor growing off the side of a benign tumor. But as you come back a little while longer and the malignant tumor sort of swallowed up the benign tumor that gave rise to it. Um, and then like this cell all of a sudden loses um, so if this cell loses its integrins then it, uh, and, its, and, its, um, and its cadherins, um, it stops expressing those on the surface, then it can float free in the blood and start to replicate um, while it's passing, while it's, while it's um, uh, replicating in the blood. 
and for and for a while there'll be just cancer cells circulating in your in the blood, and um, uh, and one of the ways that physicians can tell whether you have a cancer that has become metastatic is just to look for um, cancer cells in your blood. So if you have like a liver tumor and they start finding cells that look mostly like liver cells that are a little bit different from liver cells circulating in your blood, they might not even find where the new metastatic cancer site is yet, but they just know that you've got circulating cells from your tumor going around your blood. So these cells are circulating and dividing in your blood for a long period of time, um, and then by chance, one of them starts to express an integrin, and that could be an integrin that attaches to the kidney, could be an integrin that attaches to the skin, it could be an integrin that attaches to anywhere, and then once it expresses that new integrin, then it will stick to that tissue the next time it circulates past it. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but we'll sort of just sit. It sticks to the tissue the next time it circulates past it, and then, and now you've got a second tumor site in that new tissue. Does that kind of make sense? So first you lose the integrins to break free, then the, then the cells are circulating in your blood for a while, and then when they start expressing new integrins, the, the small fraction of them that express new integrins can get embedded in a new tissue. Yeah? Based on that, I mean, like, what's basically like determining what type of cancer this is? Like, like is it just randomness of like what type of interference they make to determine like hey this is the tissue that's impacted so you have this type of cancer where where the where the metastatic cancers take up residence is mostly random different types of can so can i i'm not being an oncologist I, I don't know for sure like the ins and outs of all this but i do know that like um uh uh um, melanomas, I think, are more likely to metastasize in, um, in neural tissue than they are to metastasize in bone tissue. Um, whereas uh, um, uh, different uh, other types of cancer might be more likely to metastasize. In, so where they land is sort of a weighted random chance, in a sense, um, based on where they started from. But that gets a little bit... Um, there, is there means of travel also always the blood, or can they go directly? Like, say there, like you have like skin cancer. Is it possible that that metastasizes like deeper into just like your muscles, or it, like impacts your skeletal tissue, or is it always like it travels? I the blood? think it usually has to go through the blood. I don't know. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. I think it can spread a little bit locally, but I don't think it goes. Uh, I think it ends up going the blood. It's like, yeah. So that's like the main form of like, metastasis. Yeah, okay. that's, and that's also like like um, why they measure uh, whether you have any detectable cancer cells in, in a blood draw. Um, now you can have no detectable cancer cells in a blood draw, but maybe there are still a few metastatic cells floating around that just didn't happen to come out in that like five milliliters of blood that they extracted from your veins or something like that, um, which is why uh, people can sort of have cancer that appears to be in remission and all of a sudden new metastatic tumors are showing up because um, you, uh, they, 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 you got rid of almost all of the cancer cells, so the, the random 10 milliliters, or 5 milliliters or whatever that you drew out of the person's veins didn't have any detectable metastatic cells in them, but there were, you know, in the, in the 3 liters of blood, there were a few metastatic cells that, that made it through the chemotherapy. And then, and then, you know, five years later, the cancer reappears because those cells have been found to have any response to the response. Can I ask one more question? Um, yeah, sure. So is the initial type of cancer kind of based on where the mutation occurs initially? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, she had you get up for yeah. a while, yeah. Um, so when, um, when they are floating through the blood, yeah. and is it just due to random mutations that they would express new integrins? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. <coughs> So for the malignant cancer versus the metastatic one, for the right. malignant, is it just when it starts losing the cadherin and the metastatic is when it starts attaching to new ones? No, once it loses the cadherins and breaks free, then it's metastatic. Because okay. um, then it's really like a matter of time before it, because you've got cancer cells floating around in your blood and they're replicating in your blood and it's kind of just a matter of time before it's going to take up residence somewhere. Okay. Um, yeah, malignant versus not has to do with the rate of growth and how, um, uh, and um, and also like how much damage it's causing locally. Like you could have a malignant tumor that's not metastatic. Yeah. So, yeah. It's not. It's not. Get, where none of the cells have left the host. Okay. So it's just malignant. Is just when it like becomes significantly bigger. 
Yeah, there's a little, this is it's more of a, it also relates to um, when the tumor is big enough and then also one of the other things that cancer cells do is um, a few of them figure out, that's again mostly by random mutations, how to convince blood vessels to start growing in and feeding the tumor and other things. Okay. So, um, and that's another thing that can define um, malignant tumors as well. Yeah, you had to get up. Uh, um, yeah, so, so um, cells stick to other cells, and there's a lot of different junctions that cells make. But the main one um, uh, that we're worried about are desmosomes. Um, and in a desmosome, um, you've got this, the, the actin cytoskeleton, which we didn't really talk about very much, but it's kind of like microtubules, but mostly just like right under the surface of, this, of the cell, um, right under the surface of the membrane. So you've got this actin cytoskeleton right under the surface of the membrane. And um, in, a, in a desmosome, you have cadherin protein, which is an integral membrane protein that spans the membrane, just like an integrin is an integral membrane protein that spans the membrane. Um, but uh, here, so here's two, two neighboring cells. This cell has an integral membrane protein that's a cadherin. This cell also has an integral membrane protein that's a cadherin. And then both are connected to actin filaments or microfilaments, which is um, a type of cytoskeleton that we didn't talk about and, uh, and you don't really need to remember. Um, the, the, the critical thing to remember about this is that the outside parts of these stick together, hold on to each other. So these are the two cells holding on to each other. Um, and, and so yeah, so these are, these are called cadherins. And different tissues, so liver tissue, brain tissue, um, uh, um, uh, uh, kidney tissue, bone tissue, whatever, different tissues will express different cadherins. So, um, so a liver cell would not stick to a kidney cell, but two liver cells would stick to each other. Um, then outside the cell, there's the fibronectin and other, um, and other extracellular matrix. And again, there's different kinds of fibronectin in different tissues. And then there are integrins, which are another kind of transmembrane protein. And the integrins stick to the extracellular matrix and also connect up to the actin cytoskeleton. And so they're holding cells to the protein outside the cell. Um, yeah, lots of hands. Your hands have been up the longest, I think. Oh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so, P53 is virtually in every cell, right? It is. In every uh, cell. So, yes. so, so, my question is um, like, we know that with, with, um, lo uh, with a lo lot of function of rhinoplastoma, we'll have an eye cancer. Right. But, uh, like, but, but, the, but the eye cells also have the P53 as a tumor suppressor gene. So, right. why does losing a function of that? Ca uh, cause cancer, but like for, for example, you so know, um, you don't, you you can have. There are tumors that do not, that still have working p53. Um, about fifty percent of tumors. It's it's by far the most common thing that's lost in a, in a cancer. But about fifty percent of tumors will still have p53. And retinoblastoma tumors are a great example of that because um, they're not getting the stop divide signal, and so they keep dividing even when the other cells around them are trying to tell them to stop the virus. And it doesn't matter that they're checking their genome. Because once, because that one mutation got through at one round of cell division, and after that it looks like normal DNA, right? They've got this, they've got, they've got a mutation that they inherited from, say, dad. Dad gave them a mutation. So the, there's no damage to the DNA. It's just that is the sequence has a non-functional gene for retinoblastoma. Then the one working copy for mom got mutated. Maybe in a few cells that got caught, but in one cell it didn't get caught. And so after that round of cell division, now it just looks like every other piece of DNA. It's not damaged DNA. It's a, non, it's a gene that has a premature stop code on, but P53 and all of in BRCA2 and everything else can't tell if it, they don't, they can't read the sequence and tell if there's a premature stop code. All they can tell is if there's like some chemical change or some broken DNA strand. So it's not a broken DNA strand. So the retinoblastoma gene is non-functional, 
that the DNA isn't broken. It's just that the sequence no longer codes for the right protein. And so now these cells, even though they're checking their DNA for mistakes, they think that they're being told to divide all the time. Or at least they're, they're not aware that they're being told to stop dividing. And so there's a growth that develops. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. Um, yeah so, uh, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, can you go over like the G0, G1, G2, S stuff? Um, so, I mean, so G1 is, is gap one. It's when the cell is doing, get is when the cell is doing most of its job. <laughs> I didn't call it, you should turn it out. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, so G1 is when the cell is doing most of its job. Um, for some cells, G1 can last days. For some cells, G1 can last a few hours, depending on how quickly they're dividing. Um, S is DNA replication. That's what we talked about in Unit 1 with uh, helicase and, uh, and DNA polymerase 3 and DNA polymerase 1 and RNA primase and ligase and all of that business. Um, and that takes six hours or so for, for a typical cell. And then after S phase is done, there's another six hours of mainly the cell growing and getting more volume and membrane surface areas that can divide. Um, G0, if a cell goes into G1 and stays there for a long time, then we say it's G0. Um, and the line between a long G1 and a G0 is a little bit fuzzy, um, but some cells, uh, like muscle cells and neurons, um, uh, never divide. Some cells go weeks and weeks and weeks without dividing, and then at some point they sort of start to check their DNA again, and so once they sort of get back into the cell cycle, we say they sort of come out of G0 and go back into G1. Some cells stay in G0 forever. So, and then, and then in that case, they're just doing a job for the organism, but not dividing. Yeah, um, yeah sure. Uh, I just have a question about the difference between, like, well, like, just kind of wondering about codominance and incomplete dominance, but, like, at, like, a genetic level, and also the difference between, like, why incomplete dominance with have blended? Right. Um, so, uh, for, so with, um, with incomplete dominance, um, again, so incomplete dominance, actually both of these in a sense sort of work with the definition of functional and non-functional. So with incomplete dominance, you have two alleles, the non-functional part, <laughs> Dominance. Um, you have two alleles that exist in the population. Um, one that is um, a functional allele and one that's non-functional. Um, and so um, the functional allele, the sort of classic example is something that makes pigment makes red pigment. Um, and then the non-functional, if you have two copies of this, so little a, little a equals no pigment. So like flower, like, uh, so you have a white flower. But the trick with incomplete dominance is that um, the protein is not, the, the functional allele isn't very efficient. So, um, so if you have one copy of the functional allele, then you get some pigment, um, but not a lot, and so the flower is pink. Um, whereas if you have two functional copies, then you get lots of pigment, um, and the flower is red. Uh, but still, we've got two alleles, one that's a functional protein, one that's a non-functional protein, and they're making um, And actually, there's, there's, it turns out there's a lot of examples of things that sort of fall into incomplete dominance in the way that they behave at a biochemical level. Um, but, but, um, and, and we'll maybe get to that a little bit next, uh, on Friday. Uh, does that make sense? Okay, then so with co-dominance, that's when um, you have um, three or more alleles that exist. Um, uh, so you have um, 
functional allele one, um, functional allele, and by functional allele, I mean that, so that we have a, an allele, a version of the gene that um, codes for a protein that does some biochemistry for us. So we have functional allele two, and then we have a non-functional. Um, and I was trying to think of, I, I know there, there are some things that in a sense kind of fall into this, but, but they get to be a little bit hard to classify. The, one, the only one that I'm aware of that sort of cleanly falls into this um, is, um, is the um, A, B, and O blood types, um, where if you have, um, uh, so, um, uh, I think, I can't remember whether my mom's type A or type B, but let's say my mom's type A blood, um, and I'm type O, so assuming that there wasn't some mix-up at the hospital or something, um, uh, then, um, my ma, then my mom uh, must have an O allele, a non-functional allele that she gave me, um, and so, um, but, but phenotype-wise, um, here, uh, the book uses this I, um, but the AO, equals AA equals blood type A. So these are these are two different genotypes and then this is a phenotype. Um, and so the A allele is dominant. It's functional and if you have one copy of it then that means that in the Golgi apparatus of all of the cells that are going to make red blood cells um, there's an enzyme that adds a particular sugar that we call the A antigen sugar onto it. Um, uh, and so, um, if you have, and I think, I don't know, let's just say my dad, let's say my dad's type B, and so, um, uh, so my dad must be this, but he, uh, but in his phenotype. Um, it's, it's indistinguishable from the chromozygous for this. Um, it's just when he has kids and they start being type O that you figure out which genotype it is. Or you send it off to 23 and me or something and figure out which genotype it is or something like that. Um, uh, and, then, um, and then the non-functional allele is just OO uh, equals type O. Um, and then there's one other possibility, which is that you have um, one copy of each functional allele. Um, so your genotype is AB, and then your phenotype is blood type AB, which just means that both sugars get expressed on the surface of the protein. And so again, we're dealing with functional alleles that code for protein to do stuff, and not in non-functional allele that doesn't code for for something. Um, and so dominant and recessive mostly work, it's just that things get a little bit complicated by the fact that there are two functional alleles rather than one that exists in the human population. Um, even though in any individual human being, you only have two alleles. Um, uh, but in the human population, there are, there are three alleles floating around. Um, yeah, sure. So, yeah. Um, so when you say that the with tumor suppressor genes, and the fact that you can lose both copies of each one. Um, how is it that cancer is so common in people with all of that? Because we have a lot of cells, um, and, uh, and as, as you age, I mean, so, so every single round of cell division is an opportunity to um, but let's, on, let's say on average, uh, it's, it's close to this, but let's say on average, every time a cell divides, one single base gets mutated in your DNA, and that doesn't get caught. So, you know, maybe 10,000 mistakes are originally made, but 9,999 of them are caught and repaired, one of them gets through. And so most of those are in non-coding regions, or maybe it make a silent mutation, or a conservative mutation that switches lysine for a, a valine or something like that, a leucine for a valine, lysine. Leucine prevailing, um, uh, but every once in a while you get some loss of function and mutation, um, and so um, so what that means is right now me here I'm like ten or twenty trillion cells right here, um, so each one of those has one mutation that is picked up 
every time it divided. Um, so that's 10 trillion different mutations in the 6 billion nucleotides. So every nucleotide's probably been changed at some point. A lot of those cells that had, if anything happened to them, they died. Um, but, um, but you know, not only am I 10 trillion cells now, but um, I hope to continue to be 10 trillion cells for another 30 or 40 years at least. Um, and over those 30 or 40 years, there are a lot of cells in my body that will die. Um, cells in my intestine, cells in my liver, cells throughout my body that just sort of wear out and die and need to be replaced by stem cells. And so, um, and so that's more cell division that's going on. Um, I, just kind of making up a guess, but I imagine something like maybe 10 billion cells, there's probably 10 billion meiosis events a day in my body, and so if each one of those meiosis events is one point mutation, then that's a lot of opportunities for a loss of function in some, in some gene to, to pop up in a cell. And so by the time I get to be really old, by the time I you know 30, 40 years from now, a lot of my cells have probably lost one copy or another of a lot of tumor suppressor genes. And then at some point, one of them loses that second copy of that same tumor suppressor gene that one of its great, 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 great grandmother cells have lost. And so then that cell all of a sudden starts becoming trouble. Um, there's actually, yeah, the, um, it's not so much a question of why, it's, it's actually a harder question to figure out why I don't already have cancer um, than to figure out why. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and, that, and that's because my immune system's working for me and there's a lot of these systems put into place. But uh, considering how many cells there are, um, it's almost surprising that I don't already have it. Yeah, sure. Um, is, is NPR area of, of like genome just as likely to like a mutation as another? Or is it just like, I don't know, like your liver has specific like portions of DNA unpacked and those are really I think, damaged. I think to a first approximation, they're about equally likely. Um, on an evolutionary time scale, there, there, there are places that are more likely to be mutated than not because if they, if a place does, if some place does get mutated, then, it, then some, some places that are very important for survival, you don't see mutations in the population okay. because organisms that carry those mutations die. Um, but on uh, but on a um, on a cell by cell division by division basis, um, I, as far as I know, it's like perfectly random where where the mutations happen. Yeah, sure. Um, in terms of like when um, like meiosis is happening, um, there's you know like there's microtubules like the cytoskeleton already like all along the cell. Is yeah. it also like already inside the nucleus like holding up the structure or is it like the... No, the microtubules are not in the nucleus. Um, so they come in from, these are like the same ones that are outside? Uh, yeah, so in prophase, the nuclear envelope breaks down and the chromosomes start to condense into their like really tight bundle that, they, that they're going to be. Um, and uh, uh, let's see, do I have, I think it's on this slide here. Um, and so, um, yeah, so in prophase, the, the chromosomes start to condense, the nuclear envelope starts to break down, and then by prometaphase, um, uh, the nuclear envelope has basically completely dissolved, and now where the nucleus was is the, the microtubules can now get into that space. Um, <coughs> Is the, and then in terms of like the two kinds, like the, um, I forget the names, but the, the something in the kinesine? kinesine and Dine, dining and kinesine? Yeah, do yes. they play any role in terms of... Yeah, so um, sort of. The, what, at, at the centromere, where the, um, where the uh, microtubule connects to um, on each side, and then eventually the centromere is going to break, and the two sister chromatids are going to go to opposite sides, um, there's a, a big protein complex called a kinetochore, which is um, related to dynein and kinesin, um, and, and, and it is able to walk along the microtubules. Um, it actually breaks the microtubules down, sort of eats its way along the microtubules, and there's a picture, of, in, in at least an earlier edition, but I think in this edition too, where it's just sort of like chewing its way down the, the microtubules. Um, but, uh, but so 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 the kinetochore is 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 related to dynein and kinesin, but it's not the same thing. 
Um, yeah, sure. Can you talk about that? Um, yeah, I mean, so again, with those, it's just, um, it's, it's uh, there's not, so, so it's, it, uh, it's it, they're proteins, and when you, so Huntington's is the main example, there's another, there's others, um, I, I mainly know about the ones in the way, there's spinal cerebellar uh, something or other, um, uh, um, but, um, but what that is, is just, um, it's a dominant protein from both a cellular and organismal perspective. Um, and that, what that means is that one bad copy is going to start creating toxins that will kill the cells that that protein is expressed in. Um, and, uh, and one bad copy that you inherit means that whatever cells this protein gets expressed in will start to die off. Um, and the only ones that I'm aware of are a couple that are in the brain and I'm not really 100% sure as to why, but it may be just because the brain's a little slower to develop than some other organs, and so you can survive long enough to have kids, and so that's why they persist in the population. I have to think a little bit more about that. But essentially, um, it, yeah, so, so um, it's, it's, it, it will kill the cell, and if you inherit 